Good evening. Uh, so uh, welcome to this uh, CFA event, uh, virtual CFA event since uh, COVID forced it this way. So a couple of months ago, uh, Nathalie Columili, our executive director, uh, proposed that we organize an event with Jean-Marc Jancovici, who's here. Obviously, we were extremely enthusiastic at the ESG committee. Uh, for those who don't know Jean-Marc, I'm not sure uh, still someone can not know Jean-Marc, but he's a founding partner of uh, Carbon4 and a great lecturer on climate and energy issues. Uh, so you may have heard him already. And he is a prolific author. So uh, for those who haven't read it yet, uh, Le Monde Sans Fin is uh, a definite must. Um, now, we're, we being the CFA Society Friends, uh, we have uh, mainly CFA charter holders in our uh, community. So we wanted an event uh, that was linked to finance. And this is where Gabriel Ouet, uh, my predecessor and now a head of the ambassador committee, had the idea of inviting and contacting uh, Orita Zoulet. So um, thank you, Gabriel, for the great idea. And thank you, Orit, for accepting. Uh, Orit uh, has uh, created the Green Hub at Natixis and uh, created the Green Weighted Factor that uh, we'll be talking about a bit later. Uh, it's all, it was also an opportunity for us to um, partner with Natixis once again, since uh, we already had it, uh, organized the Investment Professional of the Future event in the past, as well as the uh, Business Ethics Workshops. So this is uh, very nice partnering again. Um, Natixis also supports the CFA uh, via sending a lot of people to the CFA ESG uh, certificate. I think it's already 90 uh, uh, people for this year. So uh, thank you for your support again. Now to make the transition between climate issues and banks, uh, we needed to be guided a little bit through questions of methodology. So uh, Melissa Perez uh, is joining us tonight. Uh, she's a business development manager at Carbon4 and also a passionate board member of the Shifters, the non-for-profit non unit uh, with 12,000 volunteers, I think. Uh, across Europe, supporting the SHIFT project, uh, the think tank on a mission to decarbonize the economy. So they recently published their Plan de Transformation de l'Economie Française. For those looking for a few ideas uh, of what to do in the next 30 years, this uh, should give you a few ideas. Uh, finally, we have uh, Karen de Gouve, uh, Director of Climate at the Fédération Bancaire Française, who's joining us. She's also a member of the Net Zero Banking Alliance. So we're hoping to have uh, a little bit of an international uh, viewpoint and perspective on the discussion. So with that said, I'm speaking a bit too much. So uh, we, we will start. I'll give the mic to Victor Murzo, who's a member of the ESG committee at the CFA Society France, and who was uh, very instrumental in organizing this event. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lenny. So uh, now before uh, giving the um, uh, talk to Jean-Marc, I would like to ask a question. So it's, um, it's now a scientific consensus that we experience a man-made man uh, global warming caused by carbon emissions. So could you please um, give us a sense of the scale uh, of the challenge ahead? Suppose I say no. <laughs> <laughs> I will try to do that. Uh, what uh, lies ahead of us uh, could be called uh, a story of energy or a story of climate. Uh, and actually, I'm going to introduce the subject with a very simple identity, uh, which is uh, a drama, uh, as well as it explains uh, almost everything uh, regarding what happened during the 19th and 20th century. The identity is, uh, is in front of your eyes. It's very simple. It says that basically when you look at the GDP, you look at the energy consumption and you look at the CO2 emissions. Uh, it's about all the same. Uh, so I could write that uh, the size of the economy is the size of the energy consumption and the size of CO2 emissions. Actually, uh, I might say it, but it's better to uh, see it. <laughs> Uh, the, the first chart that like you can see here, uh, it plots the energy consumption of humanity against the world GDP for the last 50 years, more or less. So uh, this chart, the, 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 the plot begins in 1965 
and it goes up and right uh, until 2020. And you can see that we have almost a straight curve, meaning that the more energy we have, the more GDP and vice versa. It's also true that energy equals CO2. Here you have the same curve that plots CO2 emissions against the energy consumption on Earth. And you can also see that you have not almost, but really a straight line, meaning that as, as we, we emit as much CO2 as we use energy on Earth. And so as a result, here you have a third curve, which is very logical given the, the, the two first, which is that if you plot the world GDP against the world CO2 emissions, you also get almost a straight curve. Now, the good question is why? Uh, in order to understand this, we have to uh, go back to the meaning of energy. When you say the word energy, there are a number of reflexes that can happen in individuals. One of the reflexes that can happen, uh, especially in present times, is energy is something that you pay, and uh, right now you pay far too much. Uh, actually, when you look at energy as a bill or as a cost, you miss the point or you miss most of the point. I'm going to explain with a very simple example. Let's take this company, SNCF, uh, which pulls trains. Uh, in order to pull trains and in order for people to take trains, you need two things. You need people that work in the company and that will cost to SNCF about half its expenses. And you need energy to pull the trains, which is going to cost about 3% of the expenses of the SNCF. Now let's assume that the Minister of Transportation says to the head of SNCF that his costs are too high and that he should reduce the cost by 6%. First possibility, uh, by 3%, sorry. The first possibility is that you fire 6% of the staff. Uh, SNCF goes on strike, uh, no trains for two months, and then traffic resumes because people have to work, and you still have an SNCF with trains, maybe slightly less trains than before, but you still have trains. Second possibility is that the head of the SNCF stops to purchase energy and has no energy anymore. That's also 3% of savings, only you do not have an SNCF anymore because you do not have any trains anymore because they, they, they just don't operate. This very simple example shows that the dependency on energy is not reflected by the share of energy in the cost. So basically, looking at energy as a cost is missing the point, which is that all our activities depend on energy that is on machines. A second thing that can come to mind when uh, we discuss energy issues is that energy should be saved. You know, when you when you look at a search engine, when you use a search engine and you, you type in the best energy, sometimes uh, the, the suggestion is that is the energy that you don't use. Actually, it's not that what we have done for the last century and a half, uh, as you can see on this on this uh, chart. Uh, energy is something that we have used more and more and absolutely no technical innovation whatsoever for the last century and a half has allowed us to save energy on the global scale. So today, when some engineers say, trust us with this and that technical innovation, just let us spread the innovation and energy will be saved in absolute figures. Well, they are taking a bet which has never materialized in the past, never. And most of the energy that we use today is fossil fuels, and it was already the case 50 years ago. The share of fossil fuels in the energy mix in the world is now 80%. It was 80% in 1974. It has not changed since then. 1% uh, more, 1% less, uh, but uh, give or take some, it's always 80%. New renewable energies on this chart are the pink part, which is on the top, and you can see that it is a very slight part that occupies much more space in the papers than in real life. Third thing that comes to mind right now is that we are going to, uh, we are heading for 100% renewables. Well, it's uh, very easy to be 100% renewables because we've done it for centuries and actually millennia in the past. Here is an example, for example, of 100% renewable world. So turning 100% renewable is no big deal. It's very easy. What is a good question is, will we keep an industrial civilization turning 100% renewable and we don't have the time to discuss that tonight, but my short answer is no, not a single second it will happen. But uh, it's not the point tonight. It is a little bit the point tonight. Last thing that can come to mind is uh, the last answer, uh, which is the answer D. So uh, let me introduce you D, here is D. So this is actually uh, the good answer. Actually, energy is the food of Iron Man. 
we all have an Iron Man costume thanks to energy, only it has not this shape. Our Iron Man costume that we all have on our shoulders all day long hasn't got this shape. This is our real Iron Man costume, but it has exactly the same functionalities that the Iron Man costume that you see that you saw on this graph just before. For example, the crane that you can see on this graph has the same power than 10,000 times the arms of the driver. The truck that you can see on this graph has the same power, or the engine of the truck, uh, has the same than 4,000 times the legs of the driver. The boat that you can see on this graph has the same power, or the engine of the boat, uh, than 200 or 300,000 times the legs of the captain and so on and so on. So we have a tremendous fleet of machines right now on Earth. Machines are working for us, manufacturing our shoes, clothes, shares, house, all the stuff that we can purchase. And these machines have the power of an Iron Man costume. Actually, when you compute the power of all the machines on Earth and compare it to the power of our muscles, you realize that these machines with their own food, which is energy, have multiplied the power, the muscular power of humanity by a couple hundred. On average in the world, it's 200. On average in OECD countries, it's closer to 1,000. Another way to put it is that if we didn't have energy on Earth, no oil, no gas, no coal, and marginally no uranium, no uh, waterfalls, uh, no wind, etc. In order to live the same way that people live in OECD countries, each one of us should have should have 1,000 slaves at his disposal all year round, all day round, all week round. Another way to state the same thing is that if we didn't have machines and energy, the, the world GDP would probably be divided by 100 to 200. And I am not sure that there would be a tremendous finance industry. <laughs> Uh, so that's the explanation of this curve, and actually you can interpret this curve another way, which is that you replace energy by the active fleet of machine, and then you have a very simple explanation. The size of the world production is as big as the size of the active fleet of machines. And as these machines use an energy which is mostly fossil fuels, you also have an explanation for this curve which is that uh, the size of the economy is as big as CO2 emissions. And now you understand one very simple thing, is that one of the ways that allow us to win for sure, or to meet for sure to be uh, the, the, the two degree goal, is to slash the GDP by three or four. That's something that works for sure. Anything else is a bet that we might win or that we might lose. In order to understand that uh, the economy doesn't help much uh, in order to address uh, that issue, we have to go back to uh, the time at which modern economy was founded, or classical economy was founded. Here you have a picture of Mr. Jean-Baptiste Say, uh, one of the founders of the classical economics that we use today. And he said at the time, uh, what everybody considered as true, that uh, natural resources were so big, close to infinite, that we didn't have to take care of natural resources uh, when designing uh, the, the, the equations of the economics. We just had to look at the, re uh, at the real bottlenecks uh, at the time, which were human labor and human capital. At the time, two centuries ago, a good approximation for the world was the infinite. There was absolutely no bottleneck on natural resources. And as economics is just caring about what is rare, at the time, the only limiting factor was human labor and human capital. Natural resources were not limiting. But now the orders of magnitude have tremendously changed and we have kept the same convention, which leads us to consider that this is worth nothing. Okay, if I put it another way, because in CFA you have accountants, uh, if I put it another way, it means that right now in our economic figures, there is absolutely nothing for amortizing natural capital and no provision for future environmental risks. Those are absent, absent from economic figures. So economic figures, they do not represent the physical possibility to do something in the future. If you want to take your bets on the possibility to do something, to do something physically in the future, you have to go back to physics. 
it's not enough to look at economic figures. Okay, to take a very simple example, the cheapest way to produce electricity right now in France is renewable, it's hydroelectricity. So you could say it's cheap, it's renewable, let's scale it up. Only for that you need mountains that are free, which is why hydroelectricity is so cheap, but you can't scale up mountains. It takes millions of euros for that and tectonics for that. <laughs> we just can't do it with our muscles. Okay, so the cheap cost of hydroelectricity tells you nothing on the possibility to scale that up physically. So it's a very simple example to explain that looking at economic figures doesn't allow, is not enough to take bets that we are sure to win. It's not enough. We have to go back to physics. So the story of the 19th and 20th century is very easy uh, to describe in one slide. We have plenty of natural resources on Earth that are all free, including fossil fuels that are free. Again, nobody, nowhere, never paid a single cent for oil, gas and coal to form, just as nobody pays a single cent for the wind to form. All this is free. Fossil fuels burn and allow to power machines that allow to transform all the rest of the natural, all, all the other natural resources that we have on Earth, and that allows to manufacture the 100 million different products that we can now buy, not mentioning the services. And it has allowed, because we have put machines to work, to tremendously change the way human societies are organized. We do not need people in rural areas anymore because machines uh, harvest crops for us. So we have put people in factories, then cities. In all countries in the world, when you have more and more energy, the fraction of the urban population increases. We have more free time because we do not have to do physical work. So we can have long studies, retirement. Retirement didn't exist two centuries ago. Long studies for everyone didn't exist two centuries ago. Uh, it's, we have globalization. Uh, we have 35 hours of work, not for the people in this room, but uh, in France, uh, we have six weeks of holidays, etc., etc. All this is a gift of abundant energy. Of course, we have other bottlenecks than human labor and human capital now. And actually, we have more, uh, I would say, um, the, the bottlenecks that are really applying now are physical. We have extra work everywhere. This is unemployment. And every and excessive capital everywhere. This is inflation of assets that we can witness everywhere. So today, the limiting factors of the economy are neither capital nor human labor, but are physical resources and bottlenecks in the environment. So the two bottlenecks that I'm going to elaborate briefly on are first uh, the upstream bottleneck, will we have a sufficient supply of fossil fuels? And the downstream bottleneck, which is will we experience a climate change which will exceed our possibilities to adapt uh, in good humor? Looking at the second issue, which is the most commonly known. Here is a graph showing the greenhouse gases emissions coming from human activities for the last century and a half. In brown, you have CO2, yellow methane, and in blue, you have nitrous oxide and fluorinated gases. What you can see on this graph is that just, for, uh, just as for energy, no technical innovation has ever stopped the rise of these emissions. Okay, uh, any, any, any device that you can think of has not enabled a halt in these emissions, and the only times at which these emissions have decreased is when we experience economic crisis. Looking at the structure of emissions today, here is a pie chart that gives the answer. 20% of the world emissions come from coal power plants alone, half of them being in China. So every time you buy something made in China, you buy something made in coal. 7% of the uh, world emissions, that's all gas aggregated, come from gas-fired power plants and marginally oil-fired power plants. 4% come from seven plants, 12% come from the rest of the direct emissions of industries, so not mentioning the electricity they use, uh, and in, uh, among which you have 4% also for the steel industry, 4% for basic chemicals, and 4% for the rest of the industry. 5% is coming from buildings uh, that are boilers of buildings. Uh, of course, all buildings on Earth are not heated. Uh, some of them are cooled. And then again, the electricity production is in the, in the slices that pertain to coal and gas-fired power plants. 14 percent, 15 percent is transportation, in which six uh, belongs to cars, four to trucks, and two and two to boats, uh, the merchant fleet, uh, and uh, planes. 
Uh, what you can see on the uh, right now, for example, is that uh, all transportation means on Earth uh, approximately equal the emissions of the industrial processes, the direct emissions. Uh, that transportation is a smaller issue, so to say, than coal-fired power plants. Uh, or that trucks and cement plants uh, represent a problem of about the same magnitude. 18% of emissions come from agricultural processes. Uh, there you have methane coming from cattle, methane coming from rice paddies, uh, nitrous oxide coming from fields uh, after using fertilizers. Uh, a very slight part of these emissions come from CO2 emissions coming from uh, mechanical devices such as tractors or harvesters. 11% comes from deforestation, which is basically chopping down trees and burning them uh, or doing something else uh, in order to clear forests uh, for agriculture for fields. So uh, at large, eating is 30% of the world emissions. And th those are non-energy related processes. 7% is coming from waste management uh, leaks among cooling systems, uh, including systems, sorry, uh, and various uh, miscellaneous uh, things. So as you can see, this is the structure of the emissions, and we will see later on that these emissions have to decrease by 5% per year if we want to meet the, Paris, uh, the, the, the objective of the Paris Agreement, that is uh, um, temperature rise limited to 2 degrees. Uh, gives you a magni the magnitude of the challenge, uh, and again, uh, it is very unlikely that we will achieve that in a world with a growing economy. Energy represents about 60% uh, of the emissions, so it's not 100%, but it's a big part. One of the things that one should keep in mind is that we are looking at an issue where, where, where there is no reset button. Uh, carbon dioxide is an oxide. Oxides are very stable molecules on Earth. Actually, they can remain under the form of oxides for a billion years. Once in the air, there is no chemical process to remove carbon dioxide. Uh, the processes that remove carbon dioxide from the air only happen when the air is in contact with the surface and there are slow processes. It explains why after we stop emissions, we may, uh, sorry, one century after we stop emissions, 40% of the surplus of CO2 that we have created with our emissions will still be in the atmosphere. 1,000 years after we stop emissions, 20 to 30% of the surplus that we have created will still be in the air. And 10,000 years after we stop emissions, 10 to 20% of the surplus will still be in the air. This means that the state of the atmosphere that we had before the industrial times will never come back. It will never come back. We have changed the composition of the atmosphere. Part of it is just irreversible in historical uh, and, and long historical times. It means that we have to manage this issue at timescales that are way beyond what we are able to understand, which is one, the life of, of a human being, even the life of several human beings. And of course, it is way over uh, the, 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 the time lags or the time span, sorry, that, that we are accustomed to when we manage something. For example, I don't mean to be offensive, but uh, the long-term strategy in any company, be it carbon-4 of Natixis, is a couple of years, not a couple of centuries. Uh, the strategy of our, uh, our president, uh, when he or she is elected, uh, is, going, is, going to, uh, is going to take, or she is going to take into consideration a couple of years, even a couple of decades, but not a couple of millennia. So we have here a very huge difference between uh, the times at which we should, well, the, the, the time scale at which we should manage the issue and uh, what we are accustomed to when we manage our own systems, our human systems. If we look at the temperature rise, which is at stake, this graph uh, gives an answer. The zero here refers to the global average on Earth for the last half of the 19th century. You can see that uh, during the 20th century, the average temperature has risen by a little bit more than one degree, and this is already enough to trigger huge wildfires in Siberia, Canada, uh, California, Australia. It has been enough to kill 15% of the corals. Uh, it is enough uh, to um, uh, trigger uh, the progressive death 
of a number of trees, a number of species already uh, in the, in the, at mid-latitudes. It's already enough uh, to have triggered hunger um, uh, riots uh, in, in the northern part of Africa, etc. So at this point, just one point something degree is already enough to uh, have triggered a number of consequences. And some others, like for example, the melting of Greenland that has begun and that will now not stop whatever we do. Okay? And so we, we are assured to have an ocean rise of more than three meters in a couple centuries because uh, the melting of Greenland has already begun. So even if we stopped emissions today and stabilized the world temperature, a number of consequences of a stabilized temperature increase will grow nevertheless. Okay, it's not when the temperature stabilizes that the, that the consequences stop to increase. They go on increasing afterwards. For the 21st century, as you can see, uh, we have a bracket between a lower end, which is we meet the Paris Agreement, but you will uh, understand uh, in, a, in a couple of seconds what it means, and a higher end, which is we call on coal, so to say, uh, as much as we can. Uh, and then we have a temperature increase of something like four degrees to five degrees at the end of the century compared to pre-industrial times. In order to understand that this is pretty much, uh, sorry, uh, one of the things that uh, someone should keep in mind is that because of the inertia of the social systems and of the climate system, what is going to happen for the 20 years to come is about the same, notwithstanding what scenario we follow. So basically, whether we follow the, the path that leads us to the, Paris, to, the, to the objective of the Paris Agreement, or whether we just let go uh, for countries that have plenty of coal, is not going to make a, a, a huge, if any, difference for the 20 years to come. Another way to put it is that climate change is just like a car, uh, where when you start to press on the brake, the car still accelerates for the 20 years that follows. It's a way to put it, okay? If we compare that temperature increase to ancient times, here is a curve that goes back in time uh, for 20,000 years. For the last 10,000 years, the average temperature on Earth has been almost what it was during pre-industrial times. The zero on this scale is the, has the same meaning that on the previous one, okay? Uh, and you see that the average temperature of Earth has changed by a fraction of degree over 10,000 years. So the climate system has been very stable, which allowed our civilization, which allowed human beings to settle and begin agriculture. Otherwise, if the climate system had been very volatile for this period, we wouldn't be here because agriculture would have never existed. Uh, before that, we, we were in an ice age and actually from uh, minus 100,000 years to minus 20,000 years, uh, the Earth was uh, in a stage where, it, where ice uh, was present over Canada, uh, over Scandinavia, over part of Siberia, and temperatures were much cooler. Actually, they were much cooler, but they were only four degrees on average below the pre-industrial average. So basically, at the time where France looked like picture that you have on this on this slide, uh, the average temperature was only four degrees below what it was at pre-industrial times. This is the increase that we have already triggered for the 20th century. And this is the increase that we might trigger in the 21st century. It's not even the higher end of the bracket. It is just, I would say, a business as usual regarding coal, as long as we can coal on coal uh, without many difficulties. You can see that the temperature rise, which is at stake, would be extremely brutal compared to something that has already triggered a huge change, which was getting out of an ice age. And uh, I would say a simple consequence that you can keep in mind if we follow this path is that it's going to destabilize human settlements everywhere. And we are going to experience a world which is going to be brutal, violent, with not many democracies in the world, <laughs> Uh, life expectancy that is going to sharply decrease and the size of the population which is going to decrease very significantly. This is what is at stake if we follow that path. Okay? It's not just a matter 
of triggering some financial instability. <laughs> it's going to be much worse than that. If we want to stick uh, to the two degree objective, this is, the, 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 this is going to give you the rule of three. This curve, uh, which is coming from the last IPCC report, uh, explains that the average temperature rise that we'll experience uh, for the planet is a linear function of the accumulated emissions that we will cause. At the end of the year 2020, we had emitted 2,300 billion tons of CO2 on Earth, causing a 1.1 or 1.2 degree increase of the average temperature. If we want to stick to a 1.5 temperature increase, it means that we can emit, humanity, 3,000 billion tons of CO2 in cumulated terms, of which 2,300 have already been emitted meaning that for the rest of the 21st century, we can still emit 700 billion tons, which is roughly a third of what we have emitted in the past. And most of what we have emitted has been emitted since uh, the last world war, the last 80 years. If I put it another way, knowing that the average population for the century is probably three times as numerous as it was during most of the 20th century. It means that a baby born today, sorry to say, a baby born today, if we want to meet the 1.5 degree objective, can emit for his whole lifetime a tenth of the emissions that his grandparents that died today have emitted during the life. A tenth. Not 5% lower, a tenth. If we want to meet the two degree objective, then we should stick to 3,500 billion tons of CO2, of which again, 2,300 have already been emitted. And so my baby can emit a sixth of what? Yeah, much better. If we think that in terms of rate of decrease, it means that by the time my kids are my age, the global emissions must be divided by three on Earth. And because of what I said before regarding the correspondence between CO2 and energy, energy and machines, machines and GDP, the question is raised on whether we can meet that objective in a world with a growing GDP. Uh, something else that we have to take into consideration is that we have an upstream bottleneck. So let's say, no, it's still okay, uh, dividing the emissions by three, we don't want that, we want uh, whatever, growing GDP, plenty of cars, and uh, we don't care about that. Well, it happens that we do have an upstream constraint also on fossil fuels. Fossil fuels take a couple ten to a couple hundred million years to form. So uh, at when we consider historical times, we can uh, consider that we have an initial stock which is given once and for all. And when you pull on an initial stock which is given once and for all, you cannot extract every year more and more from the stock. This is impossible. You cannot extract each year the same amount from the stock for uh, forever. This is not possible either. This is not possible either. All you can do uh, when you have a stock which is given once and for all is start at zero, end at zero, and go through a maximum at some time. Okay, this is all you can do, and that's mass. It's a theorem that you can demonstrate. So regarding oil, there will be, or there has been a peak, but that's the same for gas, same for copper, same for aluminium, same for beryllium, same for tantalium, same for nickel, same for gold, same for silver, etc. Each time you look at the resource for which you have an initial stock given once and for all, there will be a peak for the resource which is available for the annual production of the resource. Okay. Regarding conventional oil, the International Energy Agency issued in 2018 a report saying that the peak happened in 2018. Uh, 2008, sorry, the report is in 2018, 2008, and it has a slight link with what has been called the financial crisis and the Lehman Brothers crisis. And the SHIP project, as John issued a report also uh, based on the access on a very comprehensive database on all the oil fields in the world, uh, which is called Reichstadt Energy. 
And this analysis has been performed by uh, the former head of exploration of Total, uh, the former head of development of oil fields at Total, uh, and the former oil analyst at the International Energy Agency. And uh, this is the oil production of the first 16 suppliers of oil of Europe, which happen to be the 16 first oil producers in the world, except Canada and Brazil. And this uh, chart is very clear. Uh, oil production has most probably uh, gone through a maximum, including shale oil and including tar sands. Just before COVID, actually, it was in 2018 and not 2019. <laughs> and uh, at best, uh, we could level that production for the five to 10 years to come before a sharp decrease. And that's the production. It's not the imports in Europe. The European Union, if we exclude now Norway and UK, imports almost 100% of its oil. And uh, if oil production of our suppliers goes this way, it means that the oil they will be able to export once they deduct what is going to be consumed by their own population is going to decline much, much uh, faster than this. Like it or not. And I'm done. Well, thank you very much, Domarc. Uh, it's clear that we need to get moving. Um, and so we, we we we'd like to go to the to the next step about what can financial institutions do uh, about this. And because the the first thing we we see when we 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 hear we hear that it all relates to physics is that we need operational targets. So financial institutions will need uh, will need operational tar targets. And also financial institutions are um, have their share of responsibility. Uh, with this problem. So I'd like to ask you, um, Melissa, uh, how should financial institutions uh, look uh, at the problem and uh, what metrics, what methodology can they use to, um, uh, to take their fair share of this issue and also to, um, to get the tools that they need in order to take the right actions in the right, dire in the right direction? Thank you, Victor. Uh, I think there is a slight issue on the slide, but that's fine. I will just do a slight introduction. So the first step is to understand the issue. So it's what uh, Jean-Marc has done for us. The second step is to measure actually what is your impact, what is your risk. And then the third step is actually to do some action about it, so to change your investment, to engage dialogue with the companies, uh, to thank you, <laughs> um, and even to change maybe uh, in some time the risk model uh, on how you were assessing risk before and changing the way you were doing it. So I'm actually working in Carbon4 Finance, which is uh, one of the companies that exists, which can measure um, the climate and biodiversity impact and risk. And today we are going to focus really on the methodology on carbon side, so really what we call the transition risk. So as I told you, we spoke a lot uh, with Jean-Marc about um, the transition risk, but just little step behind, there is also the physical risk, i.e. what will happen to the different assets you are investing in when there is climate hazard. And there is, of course, the biodiversity impact, which is also huge. This is not the topic of today, but just keep that in mind. This is not only climate, but also biodiversity. In Carbon for Finance, we are really scientific, science, uh, let's say, focused, and it's why we always develop uh, the database that we are actually constructing with experts in their field. And it's why we are working with Carbon for Consulting and with CDC Biodiversity. These two partners have been created in 2007, and really their role is to explain to us what we should measure, how we should measure it, what matters in which sectors because you cannot measure the same, uh, the same items in the same way for all sectors. When you look at financial institutions or automobile industry, it's really not the same. Um, as you, are, you, are, you have been saying, it uh, matters for all financial institutions. So um, it matters for asset managers, it matters for asset owners, it matters for banks, and we are going to talk about it also. But it also matters for each one of us as individual when we have some savings. So it's why we're working with financial institutions, with NGOs, and also with fintech to make sure that everyone have kind of like the right to know what is their risk and what is their impact uh, of their investment. 
Now, if we go directly in maybe what uh, you want to hear is how we measure it, what does it mean, what kind of data are available for financial institutions, and what can they do with it? So our methodology is called the CIA, so for Carbon Impact Analytics. And before entering into uh, other detail, you need to understand one principle is what is carbon accounting? So in carbon accounting, you have different scopes that we call scope one, scope two, and scope three. And the scope one and two are the scope of the company's activities. And the scope three is everything upstream and everything downstream. And it's very important to know that today, when companies publish their annual reports, even listed companies, they don't report, or a minority of them, report on the scope three. So if we take an example of an oil and gas company, they will usually, rarely report on the combustion of fossil fuel. And if you have looked at the slide before, you understand that this is a big issue. So how are we going to uh, calculate this scope free is what matters when you look at uh, climate data, uh, whatever investor, um, whatever the strategy, you really need to have a really good methodology on that. To really emphasize on that point, this is the importance of scope free when you look at different sectors. So the red bubble is the scope free and the blue bubble is the scope one and two. So even for some sectors that you might think that they don't have a scope-free, i.e. financial institution, they do have a really big scope-free. So it's why for every companies and for financial institution, it's very important to assess everything. And for the financial institution, assessing their investment is also assessing their scope-free. So really keep in mind when I look at climate or, or when I look at biodiversity, I need to look at the full value chain. So when you, are, you have this approach, the idea is to say companies are not disclosing their impact for climate or for biodiversity. We need this. How are we going to do it? The chance that we have for, uh, with Carbon for Finance is that we are partnered with Carbon for Consulting Entity, and their job for a lot of years and even now is to do carbon footprinting. So they are going to companies, they ask us uh, them a lot of uh, questions a lot of data, and then they tell us your scope one is that, your scope two is that, your scope three is that, you should do that on the governance, you should do that on the strategy, etc. We have worked with a Carbon4 uh, consulting side to develop specific methodology for what we call high stake sectors, i.e. the sectors that are inducing the most emission and the one that we should focus on for the transition. For each of these sectors, they are providing to us uh, some data that we need to collect that are public. It means that we are going to look, for example, at annual report. So as it's public, you can also do this exercise. And if we take an example of an automobile company, we are going to look at, for example, how many electrical cars, how many diesel cars, how many hybrid cars are constructed, and in which country they are sold. And with this kind of information, we are going to recalculate the scope one, the scope two, and the scope three by applying what we call emission factors. And it's just transforming physical information into what we call ton of CO2 equivalent. So that's really important not to be dependent on what the company is publishing because they are not publishing enough. So we need to have our own methodology to really recalculate everything. The second part, which is really important, and I insist on it, is for climate and biodiversity. Whatever the climate or data provider you take, you need to be really focused on, do I have a scope free? Do I have all the value chain? And how is it calculated? In Carbon for Finance, we are really transparent, and I hope that I can, uh, can say that as well, but we try to be as transparent as we can on how we calculate, why we calculate, but we also love to be challenged, and it's why we have this transparency with our clients. At the end of the day, it's some hypothesis, and we are happy to know if we can improve our methodology or calculation. Now that we have, uh, let's say, calculate all of this uh, bad emissions, so the induced emission, the question can be also, if I have a choice between two companies that induce the same emission, so they have the same risk, or if you look at the impact, the same impact, what can I do if I really hesitate between two companies which are or not in the same sector, but have the same induced emission? To answer this question, we are going to look at the two, um, let's say the third and the fourth pillar, which are the emission saving and the forward-looking analysis. So, um, to talk about the emission saving is to give you a broad point of view of what you can look uh, in a company 
I talk a lot about company, but you can do the same exercise for sovereign and for all the type of assets. In Carbon4 Group, uh, there has been a project on what is net zero. Because a lot of companies say, I'm a neutral carbon, I'm negative carbon, everything is fine, everything is perfect. And the conclusion of this study, first, is that you cannot be neutral on your own. You are only contributing to the global neutrality. And the second point is that when you are assessing a company, you need to look at three big pillars, which are the induced emission, which are the avoided emission that we are going to deep uh, in detail a little more, and also what we call the negative emission, so the third pillar. Today, in our methodology, we have the two first pillars, so the induced emission and the avoided emission, but we are developing in the next year the negative part. So it's false to say if you are looking only at induced emission and avoided emission that a company is carbon neutral. What we will advise to our clients is to look at the ratio between emission saving and induced emission. And to precise a bit what is emission saving is basically uh, two different parts. First, as the company reduces already uh, their uh, intense carbon intensity, so we are going to compare the carbon intensity of the company this year and five years ago. So this is kind of like the reduced emission. And the second part that we are going to look are the avoided emission. Is the company I'm investing in avoiding emission to others in the value chain? So the carbon impact ratio is not saying you should do emission saving minus induced emission or the other way around and saying you are negative carbon or neutral carbon. The idea is more to say what is the ratio between my avoided emission and my induced emission? So when we have then all of this data, maybe it's um, the good question is uh, sometimes when you look at information about Sandana Poor and Moody's, they have some ratings. They try to aggregate all of this data and give you a broad idea on how it's performing a company. So we are doing the same with our methodology. The idea is that we collect a lot of data about the past performance. So everything that occurs five years ago, we then have a lot of data about the current performance. And we are also looking at data about the future performance. In the future performance, it's more a qualitative um, study where we are looking at the strategy of the company, the governance of the company, but also their transparency and their target of reduction. You were speaking about targets before. The idea is not only to have targets, ambitious, even better, but to have the good target for your sector and have targets for scope one and two and scope free. So when you look at uh, annual report or communication by the company, always ask yourself, I am looking at a neutral, let's say, statement about only the carbon of the company itself, scope one and two, or have they a global strategy even for their scope free? So that's very important. When we have all of these data, we aggregate them in a global score, which is between 1 and 15. And depending on the sector, we are not going to do one third, one third, and one third on the weight. We are really looking at what is at stake for each sector and weight correctly the different pillars. When you have all of this data, all of this routine, etc., maybe if you have a look correctly what I'm saying, if you take all of the value chain, at some point you might ask yourself the question, <laughs> are we not double counting something in that case at a portfolio level? And that's true. They are double counting if you don't uh, re uh, 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 reduce them or retreat them. So we are retreating double counting at the portfolio level in two ways. The first part is that we cannot say that corporates nor that we cannot say that governments have all responsibility for all carbon emitted in the atmosphere. So we have a global retreatment between the corporate and the sovereign side. And we cannot say that each company have their, let's say, the, uh, they cannot be judged for the full value chain of everything. So at portfolio level, we are also retreating the double counting. So that is something very important. Then when we have all of this data, Coming back to what you said, Jean-Marc, before about the Paris alignment, the question that we, we have been asked a lot by our investors and our clients is, I am aligned, I am not aligned, where I am standing with this alignment? So what we are doing is at a portfolio level, we are again looking at all of the rating of the constituents, so again between 1 and 15. 
we are doing then the average of this rating and we have a curve that I will describe here that is allowing us to have the translation between the rating, which take into account again the past, the present and the future performance into a temperature alignment. So here in this slide, you can see a little curve that we call uh, the S curve. So there are two tangents coming from scientific literature. So one, uh, let's say at 1.5 degree and one at five degree. So it's exactly coming back to the slide that you have seen before. So there are the minimum and let's say the maximum of increase of temperature. And then we have two points of reference, one at two degree and one at 3.5 degree. Uh, we have constructed them, one with a low carbon sun index um, that we have constructed with Euronext and one with a MSCI World large, uh, large cap um, index. The idea here is really to try for our client to see where they are standing. There is no shame to be far away if it is the first time, but really then when you know uh, like there is an issue, you need to work on coming back to the 1.5 degree. So to do a big summary of uh, the key challenges for the financial sectors, the first part is really understanding uh, what you are investing in. And for that, it's very important to understand what is at stake for each sector. Uh, you can see on our website, we publish research paper on sectors. And the latest one we have published is on food and beverage. So you can look how we can interpret um, information about listed companies and what is really the best, the worst practices, etc. And it's also having a detailed view for each subsectors of activity, because doing some activity in the energy sector, they are not all alike. So you need to differentiate each se uh, sector of activity. The second part, which is really important, is measuring correctly, and that we are doing it for them. So we are providing them the data about each constituent of their portfolio and aggregating it also at a portfolio level. And the third point, which from my perspective is as important as having the data, is really learning. So it's why in Carbon for Finance, each of our clients have a direct contact with one of our analysts. So we have a team of 25 analysts doing every day one company analysis. And the idea is that we love that our clients ask us questions, try to understand their risk and their impact. And that is really what matters when you are looking at finance climate and biodiversity is really understanding uh, and changing, and I will say, the investment at the end of the day also. That concludes my part, Victor. Thank, thank you, Melissa. Um, now, now we'll uh, move to, to Karen. Um, so you're part of the Net Zero Banking Alliance. Uh, so with that, uh, first, maybe you can give us a few words on what the Net Zero Banking Alliance is. And maybe tell us on the international front uh, if everybody is basically understanding things the same way or are we measuring things differently or having a different point of view. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I guess after having described the amplitude of the problem and um, how tools exist out there to me measure um, the impact, um, the big question is what do financial institutions do and what can they do? Um, so I'll, I'll give you an overview of that initiative that emerged last year, uh, which is called the Net Zero Banking Alliance. It was, um, it was launched um, less than a year ago, actually. It was in April 2021 by 43 founding banks. Um, it has grown since then to more than 100 banks um, across the globe in 40 different countries. And those more over 100 banks represent 68 um, trillion US dollars of assets, which is roughly 40... 44% uh, of the global banking assets to date. And those banks, that's almost half of the banking community globally, have committed um, to uh, the Net Zero Banking Alliance, um, which is um, also part of a larger group, uh, a larger initiative called the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, which is 
uh, which you may have heard of because it was launched at the COP26 um, in Glasgow, and that's why it's called Glasgow's Initiative something. Um, and um, so that was back in um, December, November, December, I can't remember, November last year. Um, and this initiative uh, regroups all the initiative, the net zero initiatives of the financial community. So the banking, the, there's one for banking, there's one for asset managers, there's one for asset owners, that there's one for insurers and so on. Uh, there's also one for financial services. Um, so the Net Zero Banking Alliance regroups, and you have a few logos there on, on the slide of the banks that have joined, but it's literally all the, lar the, the large American banks have joined. Um, some of the large Asian banks have uh, in Latin America as well, and most of the large uh, European banks have joined the initiative, including all of the uh, members of the French Banking Federation, um, members of the, of the executive committee. Um, so what have they committed to? I quite liked showing and reminding, but uh, Jean-Marc did that very well, um, of where what's at stake and what is the, 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 the temperatures that we can expect by the end of the century if we don't do anything. Um, the, 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 the current trajectory, tell me if I'm wrong, but that's the figure that I have, is roughly around 3 point plus 3.5 degrees, maybe a little bit less now, no? Yeah, it's a debate, okay, somewhere, okay, let's say somewhere between three and four degrees Celsius um, increase from pre, the pre-industrial era. And that's what we can expect if we don't do anything, if we don't change our way of living, if we continue to extract fossil fuels um, and so on by the end of the century. Uh, the Paris Agreement, as jean marc described, has um, uh, committed to limit that temperature rise to well below 2 degrees, striving for 1.5 degree. And the uh, COP26 has confirmed that 1.5 degree objective. So basically, those financial institutions that have committed to net zero by 2050 have also committed in doing so to reduce, to contribute to reduce that climate trajectory from a current trajectory of the economy roughly around 3.5 to 1.5 degrees. And that through their activities and what they finance and, and the, the overall of their activity. One, something that is, one thing that is really important to understand that is that net zero does not mean no emission at all. Okay, net zero means no more carbon emissions than the amount the planet can absorb. And if you're looking at this from a, a bank's portfolio perspective, you can say no more than what my portfolio can absorb. So you, what you're looking for is neutrality at the, the level of your portfolio as if at the, your banking book was the same as the entire planet. That's a way to look at it, which links to um, the, the, the notion of carbon budget. Carbon budget is the amount of emissions, which uh, I can't remember the, the exact figure. We're still, the planet can still, we can still emit on the planet if we want to limit carbon, the, the rise to 1.5 degrees. If you look at it from a banking book or from an investor uh, portfolio, it's the same logic. Uh, you can say, I have such a carbon budget, which is my limit of what I invest in or what I finance can it emit if I want to limit the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. You want to add something, Jean-Marc, or is that correct? Okay. <laughs> um, so banks that have committed to uh, that net zero by 2050, that have taken that net zero by 2050 commitment, have um, committed to achieve the transition of their lending and investment portfolio. Be careful, investment is actually um, the, 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 the commitment from banks through the NZBA is investments on their own balance sheets. So it's investments that they make for their liquidity, for example. It's not third party uh, investments uh, through asset management. So it's really direct investments from the banks. So they have committed to um, uh, um, align their lending activities with a net zero by 2050 or sooner. They have committed within 18 months of the signature, uh, which happened in April for the first signatories in April last year, um, to set 2030 interim targets. 
uh, which leads us in October this year. So in October this year or before October this year, you can expect a whole for the 43 funding members at least, and very quickly behind that, a number of banks to commit to or to disclose 2030 targets on their portfolio. Um, the, those uh, 2030 targets will um, uh, the banks have committed to focus on priority sectors and the NZBA document actually lists the sectors. So there's not much latitude there on what you need to focus on. That includes all the uh, carbon intensive sectors, agriculture, uh, fossil fuel, obviously, transport, uh, power generation, uh, iron and steel, um, cement, coal, obviously, and uh, commercial and residential real estate. And they have also committed to publish annually um, several figures. They are absolute emissions and emissions intensity in line with be best practice. Um, I won't go into too much of details, but basically there is uh, online available a guide, uh, a document. If you, if you on the internet, if you look for Net Zero Banking Alliance guidelines, you'll find this document right away, uh, which is a 15 pages document um, that lists um, the commitments that the, the banks have made, um, which are basically around setting targets, um, um, establishing their emissions baselines. They will need to use the tools that were, for example, the carbon pool finance tool uh, that, that helps, that can help a, a bank uh, measure its emissions baseline. So what are the carbons, carbon emissions from my portfolio? And maybe I'll go to, to, um, to the next slide to show you a little bit of more details. Um, the, um, uh, to uh, use scenarios that are science-based, and that's really important to lead to net zero um, and regularly review those targets at least every uh, every five years. Um, there's a lot of information there. I'll just mention a, a few um, as part of the target setting end of the emissions baseline. Banks have committed to include scope three emissions of their clients. That's very important because as was just described, uh, scope three emissions is really the bulk for some sectors. Uh, you can see it's the bulk of the actual emissions. Banks have committed to measure scope three emissions of their clients and disclose scope three emissions. And that's a huge step forward. Um, scope three emissions, uh, there was a, a perfect description so of, of what they are, but obviously the, the multiple, I, won't say, I wouldn't say double counting, multiple counting. Because sometimes you count, if you finance, and the example on that slide is uh, is in the automotive sector. If you if you're as a bank, you finance the automotive manu the, the the auto manufacturer. If you finance the energy plant that feeds in, that sends the the the, the energy to for that plant to function. If you finance the the steel uh, manufacturing uh, that is used for making the car, and then if you do le car leasing, you finance four or five times the same emissions. So there is an issue with the multiple counting um, and that's um, a methodology um, issue that banks have to deal with. They haven't, um, th there isn't a perfect methodology out there yet. Maybe they will never be. Maybe it's not so much of an issue. Maybe we should accept that we add those and we, we accept those multiple countings in the, in the portfolio. Uh, but so far it is, it is an issue that banks have to deal with, that they're trying um, more or less to deal with. Um, on the on the baseline, um, they they and I just want to mention that banks have actually committed to disclose their exposure to each of the carbon intensive sectors and the associated absolute emissions, portfolio wide emissions intensity, and sector specific emission intensity. So for example, CO2 equivalent per kilowatt or per kilojoule or per kilometer, passenger kilometer for transport and so on. So in terms of transparency, I don't know if um, um, some of you have looked at some of the disclosures of the financial institutions, but less, uh, I would say less than two years ago, none of this was disclosed by anybody. Okay, and now we're talking about more than 100 banks representing half of the assets, the banking assets 
having committed to disclose all that. So you may say, okay, uh, disclosure is not taking action. But obviously, once you start disclosing, once you start measuring, the next step are the target setting. So how do you take action and the action plans uh, from the targets that you have set for yourself? Um, I will uh, uh, ju just briefly mention the scenarios because this is important. The, uh, the commitment that has been taken by banks is a net zero by 2050 commitment, which means that the baseline scenario, the benchmarks that are used to be able to set targets and to measure uh, the progress of uh, the banking sector will need to use net zero scenarios. Um, there aren't that many out there yet. Uh, the, the most popu popular one is the NZD uh, 2050 from uh, the International Energy Agency, but it doesn't cover all sectors. So there is a real need for net zero scenarios to be built. So I understand the SHIFT project has built scenarios for the French uh, economy, but we need those scenarios at a global level. Uh, they can't be just French, they can't be just European, they need to be at a global level. Um, and that's uh, an illustration of what it takes to become carbon neutral under the uh, uh, IEA and, and uh, Net Zero um, 2050 scenario. Um, a few of the, uh, uh, the, the, it's more than recommendations, basically the IEA, it's not in the, an environmental NGO, it's the IEA telling us that we need to uh, stop extracting new, well, not, not stop extracting, sorry, stop opening new oil and gas fields starting now. Um, we, um, we, we, we cannot have any more coal mine extensions. Um, we need to limit air travel to the level it was in 2019. Um, and we need to uh, stop putting on the streets new combustion engine cars by 2035, which is literally tomorrow. Um, so, um, um, but several, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, several of the, uh, the, 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 that's mostly energy intensive sectors, but several of the, uh, the sectors are not covered by the, this IEA scenario. So there, there is a real need for those, uh, those scenarios. I will skip that. <laughs> and I think you had a question on the. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, we're unfortunately time is is flying, but um, we'll probably uh, extend a few minutes afterwards. Uh, if very quickly we we mentioned uh, during the preparation work uh, the difference between impact and risk that is not always understood the same way. Let's quickly give us a definition here. Yeah, I think it's it's. I've, I've tried to summarize it here on what you see on the screen. Is basically. Um, there's a the, the 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 main impact is in the, the scope of what is covered, but also in the use cases of the two different notions. So um, when you measure impacts, when you make a net zero commitments, what you're after is your impact. What you're measuring is your impact. So um, measuring, disclosing, setting targets for the impacts of the, the, the bank's finance activities may have on climate change. So is what I'm financing, what are the impact of what I'm financing on climate change? Um, and this is used mostly for transparency so public disclosures for strategy monitoring, for client engagement, as Orit will describe uh, probably, uh, for product innovation as well, to make sure that how, what products do I need to provide to my clients as a bank um, to drive transition, to help them achieve their own transition. Um, and on the other side, you have the risk measure of the climate related risk assessment, which has measure, uh, basically two legs. Um, the transition risk and the physical risk, which were explained previously. And, and basically, what you, when you measure, when you do climate-related uh, risk assessment or measuring, disclosing stress testing, which is uh, uh, something that you may be hearing about, there's more and more uh, climate stress testing being done, um, will most likely result, because we're talking about risk, into financial impacts. So what is the impact of those risks on the finances of my client and how do they result in a financial risk? And if they are properly measured, 
risk assessment may result or may not, depending on, on the outcomes, uh, but is likely to result in a, an adjusted uh, default probabilities, adjusted credit ratings, uh, and adjusted prudential treatment. So you can see that it's very different between the risk assessment and the impact that it may have uh, for a bank and uh, the, the, the measure of impacts, uh, which is more done for driving a strategy and, and disclosing targets. Thank you very much, uh, Karen. I would like to turn to uh, Orita Zule now, because Natexis has developed uh, a leading approach in climate integration within its activities, the, uh, the so-called green weighting factor. And we, I'd like to ask you uh, if you could present uh, this green weighting factor, uh, what it is, what it is used for. Sure. Um, thank you um, for having having us here. Um, the green weighting factor is a um, an initiative that has been launched back in 2017 at Natixis, um, in with with the ambition to um, create a steering monitoring operational tool to align our portfolio um, balance sheet. That's what I mean by portfolio with the Paris Agreement. Um, that means um, that 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 meant um, to uh, decide quite a number of things. Um, to decide um, how do we assess the environmental impact and the climate impact of our balance sheet, and how do mo do we monitor it? So it led to um, quite of an extensive, and um, and I have to um, I have to say it's been a, a co-led work by. Uh, um, Karen and, and her team back in her days with us, and um, and and uh, myself and my team, um, to to um, it, it, it's it's a it's a series of of decision and work to to decide and make it an operational tool and not a reporting tool. So it wasn't really it wasn't really meant to be out there. To be completely honest, it was meant to be um, uh, steering our business. Um, the, the, the first decision that we made is we're going to try and have a mechanism that incentivize, incentivizes incentivizes sorry the origination of environmentally and climate friendly loans and uh, penalizes or disincentivize um, the the climate and and environmental um, harming um, origin or um, type of loans that we have. Um, so that was the first kind of a bonus malus for the French out there um, approach that we uh, that we wanted to have. The second um, the second decision we've made is we're going to start by um, impacting our capital allocation mechanisms. So um, in that sense, what we said is um, we're going to impact positively the risk weighted assets or an internal analytical vision of our uh, risk weight. Uh, positively uh, on what we now call brown deals and negatively um, on green deals. So reducing the, the RWA consumption of green assets and, in, and uh, increasing their uh, the RWA analytical consumption. Um, what it means is we created an alternative vision of our capital consumption and our um, uh, performance. Uh, risk um, uh, RWA and RE, uh, which is called internally the adjusted RE and adjusted green um, RWA. Um, that is the first step of the of the of the whole process, um, and the second step is what we, which is the definition of target, in terms of uh, where do we want to be in 2024. That's the 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 time scale of our strategic. 2030 and 50 in terms of color mix and we've worked with carbon 4 i'll come to it in a minute um uh, in terms of temperature of our portfolio so the whole the whole idea the whole purpose is accelerate our own transition as a cib integrate climate transition risks um into our credit decisions monitor our climate and be prepared for upcoming regulation, which is uh, which is actually proving right because it's exactly what we're seeing coming. Um, the reason why it matters is because 
we have embedded this in our credit process. So it's, it's today um, a, a given uh, project or loan um, or a given transaction, to be precise, does not accept without being assessed against our green weighting factor. So it's been a very strong management decision to make it a, um, a normal element of our of our credit process. And um, while between 2019, which is the blue line of our, our uh, mechanism and, to, and 2020, um, the color rating and the, um, the adjusted RWA and adjusted RE were additional decision making, credit decision making tool. They're becoming now, um, um, which I would call the, the carrot, uh, they're becoming now um, a, um, a, an element of, of monitoring and steering of our business activities since um, we have targets and those targets are to be met. Uh, at CIB level and at industry industry group level and, and business level. Um, so to, just to to enter a bit, sorry, um, to enter a bit into the, um, the, the approach so that it gets a bit more concrete. I'm not managing to get to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so what we've done is we've divided the world of our um, financings into two big categories what we have called the dedicated purpose financing and what we have called the general purpose financing. The dedicated purpose financing is our oldest financing where we know what we're funding and the general purpose financing are the ones where we fund organization, institutions, corporates. Um, for the dedicated purpose financing, since what we really wanted is um, adopt what we've called now the um, a systematic look through approach where we whenever we know what um, the funding are going to be, uh, what we're going to be funding, that we qualify the underlying asset or project. And there we've developed, uh, with the help of uh, ICAR and Cantis, which are two environmental consultants, um, an internal methodology, which is embedded into our IT systems, that is evaluating the, the climate and environmental impact of each and every project. And that is a sectorial approach. Um, I think we're now down to it's, it's 46 here, but it's 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 becoming 53, I think. Uh, decision, what we call decision trees, where we evaluate under a number of questions with, with, which imply um, um, a scoring system, um, the, our financings. It is applied, and there is a big typo here. Uh, obviously, our loan book is not 1 billion, uh, but, 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 but here it's applied. It's applied to um, um, a, loan, a loan book of um, uh, 164 uh, billion uh, at the last count. Um, the uh, um, so so what we so what we do is is we um, we evaluate those those uh, financings against uh, it's applied sorry, it's applied to all of all of our financing with one exception which is the financial sector and the reason why we've made the decision to exclude financial sector holding and securitization vehicles to be very precise is because it's been taking us that we uh, we both made the decision to take a breath before we take it on our peers but as well um we count on the on the upcoming regulation to very much um, in terms of, um, of visibility on the impact of, our, of, a, of a financial uh, institution's uh, uh, balance. Um, so, so that comes up into a color rating that is going from dark brown to dark green on a seven level scale. On the general purpose financing, because we didn't want to weigh on all of our uh, fellow doctors and colleagues, um, the, the, the responsibility of making a judgment at a company level or an organization level. We've made the decision to uh, work with an external party and in the carbon for finance um, to evaluate the uh, um, uh, and the color rating in this case of our of our client according to the methodology that Melissa used to use. Uh, which has been adjusted um, to our specific needs um, on the environmental, so the, the environmental non-climate related topics. So now that we have um, on the bulk of our balance sheet a color rating, um, 
We've made the decision to make it climate change centric, but it's adjusted to the most material environmental externality uh, from a biodiversity, pollution, waste, water uh, um, uh, 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 perspective. And as uh, Melissa showed you and, and, and um, uh, Jean-Marc mentioned, we have made the decision as well to adopt what we called a life cycle analysis approach, meaning that we are taking the full value chain um, impact when we look at a given a given financing. Um, the, 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 the famous uh, scope one, two and three and four, I, what I call scope four, which is the um, um, the contribution to the decarbonization of of um, uh, uh, clients of, uh, of, uh, of the companies we're funding. Um, and that's a very important element of the methodology. The other element is that we both take a, an absolute and relative approach and a cross sector and an intra sector, meaning that we have capped the color rating by sector um, to, to, um, to make sure we weren't in a class approach, but we're taking account um, uh, of the, uh, the absolute performance of our of our uh, of the various sectors um, so without going into much more details um, what what we what ended up after a very long process is an ability to systematically evaluate all of our financing now that we have that evaluation as I said it's the adjustment of our RWN REs um, interestingly um, if we go to this slide uh, this, this one, thank you. Um, a number of use cases have emerged uh, along the way of, of, the, of the development of the project. I mentioned the one, the most one, which was the credit, the credit process and lending decision making. But what, what, what appeared um, very, um, very uh, uh, in, in a very clear manner is that having developed such, such internal intelligence on, on our book and on our financings, um, we raised the interest of, um, of quite a number of our clients and it, it has allowed us to bring the climate topic to the strategic dialogue at the highest level of our dialogue with clients um, in, a, in a very significant manner. It has it, that intelligence we've built is is embedded in a lot of our product innovation and in, in and also in our ability to structure as a sustainable finance team a number of transactions and be very specific in what really matters because I didn't mention it but if you once you decide to do something like this in a um, reason, reasonable sized um, uh, company like uh, like the CIB of Texas, it means you have to be simple focus on the material elements and more importantly in a feasible manner so there was no way we were building a very sophisticated uh, model which was not answerable by our by our bankers so so we had and we worked a lot with the, with the various teams of the bank to understand to know when we actually fund or provide a given financing and what we credibly can retrieve as well as um, how much technical data can we um, can we extract from the, the, the credit process and um, it's it's moving it's a moving element of course we're getting a lot more uh, today than we were a few years ago but it's um, it's clearly um, linked on the fact that we've managed to focus ourselves on what matters um, and that helps us a lot in our product design it's uh, becoming an element of our commercial strategy and client tiering um, meaning that we have enhanced our knowledge of our clients, to be clear, and we have also enhanced our ability to to support them in their in their own um, uh, reasoning about their own transition. I think, and um, and probably uh, some of them on the line, it's been a teams onboarding element. A lot of our our colleagues have come to us with some what we what we have felt to be uh, some element of pride. Of of, um, of having a company going all in with such an initiative, um, it allows us as well to monitor the revenues we're doing with uh, what we call green uh, um, um, with the with the darkest green clients according to the rating from from Carbon Four Finance. It's also allowing us an active management of our balance sheet and and to develop some uh, specific streams of distribution as part of our originate to distribute strategy. And that's lastly, but not least, 
um, it makes us a very active contributor of the regulatory debates on how to steer the transition of a bank. Now that we have set targets, if you go to the previous slide, um, what we've done is we, we worked um, in a top-down and bottom-up approach. So bottom-up, i.e. working with all the business lines, industry groups and platforms to design what a credible evolution of our color mix, that's how we call it, uh, can be um, in 2024, 2030. And in a top-down fashion as to um, our sector capital allocation, which has obviously a very, um, a very uh, impactful um, influence on our ability to reach those targets. We have defined a target color mix and have expressed it in a, a temperature measurement, um, which, which uh, is making us uh, commit to a 2.5 degree alignment of our portfolio in 2024 and 2.2 degree in 2030 allowing us to feel comfortable with a carbon neutrality 2050 target. Now to, to just close on, on, on the green weighting factor, um, how, can we, how are we going to be reaching that? I mean, now that we have an assessment tool and we have um, you know, additional decision making tool, it, it's not making the target. Making the target, going to the last slides again, um, it's, was, I'm working now. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> we have a number of levers. Um, to actually uh, get there. I mentioned the um, the industry and sector capital allocation. So those are, that that is managerial decision as to um, how much do we allocate to oil and gas, how much we allocate to power, how much we allocate to, and it's a very strong, if it's a very strong uh, decision that is influencing our ability to reach the target. Um, our client mix, meaning who do we bank, um, that is going to be able, that is going to involve us making a dynamic perspective assessment of the transition potential and the transition dynamics of our clients and to uh, um, and to integrate that um, um, those elements in our strategic dialogue as I as I mean um, that's also what we do with our clients so what type of financing we do with our clients that means us being uh, becoming uh, increasingly key expert in key decarbonization technologies green hydrogen, CCS, um, energy storage, and the, and the likes. But also our ability to uh, develop and promote green and sustainable and sustainability linked financing. So any financing that we can provide that is supporting our clients transition. And that's a, that's a, the, the, the element of accompanying and supporting our client is a key element because what we observe after a few years is that the improvement of our clients is probably the strongest lever that we have. The more the clients we have in the portfolio are improving their, their carbon reduction, the more we actually transition. So it's a key element of our approach. And lastly, our active portfolio management um, in terms of, uh, of um, distribution strategy. So that's um, in a very short nutshell, um, what uh, the green weighting factor is. It's now fully integrated in our IT system. It will be a never ending process. We are reviewing uh, we are reviewing our methodology as we speak to make sure we um, are compliant with the latest, uh, uh, I would say, um, available technologies, but also to, um, uh, co compliant is not the right term, consistent with what the European taxonomy, for example, is providing as as indicators to uh, to evaluate all of this, so it's um it's it's a moving element, and one of the key tool that we have created to do all of this is um an extensive simulator, which is helping us and the teams um, simulate our our um, action plans and see how it it allows us to reach the targets we've defined. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you very much, Orit. Uh, that's a very interesting and complete uh, definition. Um, unfortunately, time is running out, so I will not be able to take all the questions, but I'd like to ask two questions and maybe if each one of you can answer as quickly as possible. Um, in, there are two things that came out. Uh, most of this is science-based, whatever the level of climate science down to to the, the targets and people. Uh, you were talking about the bankers and the clients. 
So my, my first question is, science is obviously evolving quite fast on this subject. We're learning a lot. Um, how do you make sure that everybody stays online on the underlying assumptions and parameters that are important? I'm going to ha happily answer that question, but I I think the, the one comment, and, the, and I know Jean-Marc is going to be agreeing on that, the accuracy of all those modeling is not exactly what matters. In, 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 where, in, in the type of environment and the, and the scale of, of challenge that has been very clearly defined today, a lot of, if, this, if, if already we, we grasp the big picture, we're going to make a huge step. So, so I think that, yes, all of this is science-based. Science I wouldn't say the science has evolved dramatically and in a very fast pace, but tools have tools to assess, tools to model, tools there are, there has been, uh, especially for us as end user, if you wish, there has been a lot of, of evolution. But um, but the, the reality is um, we we need to get moving and the pace of, of, um, of the pace and the emergency of the need is such that if a given CIS score or color rating or you name what is arguable um, to the decimals, um, it doesn't really matter. So so um, my, my opinion is that um, um, w with what we've you've seen tonight, um, we're we're managing to grasp what, what matters. <laughs> uh, if I may compliment a little on that. Uh, I necessarily agree with my client, so no. Uh, I agree with Orit for a very good, no, I agree with her. Uh, the challenge right now is not to, uh, uh, I would say, keep the pace with the changing science. It is to uh, put up to the challenge all the people, all the staff that A, generally don't know the existing science, uh, be it 10 years old or, or a last year old, uh, or last year, sorry, it's, it's actually almost the same, uh, but still there is a huge gap between what people should know in order to understand what the, the, the challenge that they have to meet and what they really know. And the second challenge is to put next to uh, an economic or financial accounting, a physical accounting, which is the sense of uh, the shades of color uh, that are represented. And, uh, and, and actually, the essence of a green weighting factor is to, is to design something which is hybrid between physics and accounting, or I would say economic accounting. And the huge challenge is in the tools, in spreading the tools, and uh, in putting people uh, to the proper level where they understand both uh, the, the physical issue and the tools that link the physical issue with the way to do day-to-day uh, -day business. Uh, that, that's the challenge. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand that half the staff of the bank uh, has to do something in the green weighting factor. Uh, it's the cor yeah. If not all, it's the correct order of magnitude. I mean, in most, uh, in most of our clients, uh, Carbon4 Finance, uh, these topics are managed by a small team dedicated, which is not really interacting uh, with the people that manage, I would say, ordinary business. Uh, so it's something that you do extra on top, on the side, whatever. Uh, and so uh, we are really happy to have been associated to this initiative because it's a first of a kind. We hope that it's not going to be a last of a kind. <laughs> uh, but again, in, in, in terms of number of people involved into the organization, it's the correct order of magnitude. Thank you. Andy. And that's the challenge. Thank you very much. And actually, that is a great transition to, for my second question. I think you, you partly answered. How much of the solution comes from a mindset change and how much comes from tools? Ninety <laughs> ten. <laughs> I would say, yeah, I think I would say ninety percent is a mindset change, and it's the change of people rather than the tools. I mean, the tools will follow. If you have the right people at the right place with the right power to decide, 
which happened, which is exactly what happened at Natixis when we decided to do the green weighting factor. Um, I say we because I was part of that story before I changed jobs. But um, the the you get you you get the tools done. It's a nightmare. I mean, Norit mentioned that the IT part, it took us four years to get where we are. It's probably going to be another 10 years before it's perfect. But but the mindset, the training is really important. Yeah. And, and if I can speak from a broader perspective, now that I see a lot of different banks working on those issues, um, this from a lot of banks, and I won't name anyone, there's a lot of, uh, um, you know, they look at Natixis and the green weighting factor and what was done with a lot of, uh, you know, envy and a mix of envy and fear that this is going to fall on. Actually, a lot of people have told me, oh, you've come to deploy the green weighting factor amongst all the banks. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a mix of both, but it, it, this was, I mean, this way of looking at things, of measuring the impacts, of driving the strategy, of uh, embedding in every single credit decision of the bank is the way forward. Um, it may not be called the green weighting factor, it may be called something else, but this is the way forward. At the end of the day, the climate impact needs to be in every single decision within the banking activity, within the investment activity. It needs to be mainstream. It's becoming mainstream. Um, and the tools will follow if the mindset is there and the, and the right people take the right decisions. I have very little to add, but what I would say from a personal st standpoint is uh, I usually describe the green weighting factor as um, the most interest interesting um, um, so so sociological um, um, uh, experience of my career from an organizational perspective uh, because because it's um, we've gone all of us through a journey of the if coming the how and now the when which is really the the, the journey through which we all went through um, and and I have to say we you know and I and I really mean it the the support we've had by top management has been instrumental. And I think what that is often what lacks because the fact that we had our, our CEOs and, and, heads, um, and heads of CIBs um, all in support and making decisions such as, this is not compulsory to access credit decision, which, which has been the game changer really in, in, the, in the deployment of the process, was a super strong decision. I mean, it's an additional process and you know how, how processed we can be. Um, and, um, and, it's, um, and, it's, um, and it's also also asking a lot of people to get their head around a new topic, which they, almost none of them were trained on. Um, so, uh, so clearly I agree with the 9010, um, not saying the 10 are easy, the 10 are complicated, but but without the 90, it's just not happening. I, I will complete on that. And it's the reason why even we, if we are a data provider, we provide, uh, we'll say, half data and half services and answering questions and learning and sharing and everything because only the data will not help anyone. So it's really important to, to help and construct uh, tools and new methodology with our clients. I totally agree. <laughs> Thank you very much. So uh, with that, I will have to conclude since uh, we're 20 minutes over. Um, well, first off, thank you very much, all of you. Uh, thank you, Jean-Marc, for the, the cold shower. I hope everybody survived. Um, hopefully, we we had, thanks to, to Melissa, Karen and Orit, uh, uh, a view that things are changing pretty quickly at banks. So there is hope. Um, I would also like to thank uh, the people who are behind the scene. Uh, so we had Marie Alix and Benedict, both for the CFA and uh, Natixis organizing everything behind. Uh, we also had uh, my colleague uh, Gabriel, who was instrumental in organizing this event, and he was not uh, here on on the panel, but uh, he's here in the room. I'd also like to, to thank in the audience uh, the members of the Commission du Label ISR, who I know uh, were connected, and the students who participate in our research challenge at the CFA Society France. 
uh, as well as the students of the city of Grenoble, uh, European capital of ecology this year. So thank you for being there with us. Um, I will announce for those who want, we have another event next week on the 22nd uh, on the French pres presidency of Europe. And hopefully we'll have another event in, uh, in the future with Natizis. Thank you again, a very special thanks to Arit uh, since this partnership was thanks to you. And with that, we'll keep you posted. Thank you.